you need to make sure that your bank has enough liquidity that they can handle momentary panics. I also think that in a circumstance like we're in today, in addition to having at least $100,000 in cash, that that same million dollar portfolio ought to have a, at least $100,000 in gold and or silver bullion. Gold, from my point of view, is insurance. One could call it really good if volatile cash. You can always sell it uh, and it performs well, even in liquidity squeezes. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad and privileged to have this distinguished returning guest, Rick Rule, formerly the CEO of Sprott Asset Management and currently the CEO of Rule Investment Media, joins us this Thursday, April 20th, 2023. Rick, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Always a pleasure, Donegan. Thank you for having me back. Our viewers look forward to your visits here because you bring such a broad and deep experience with natural resource investing, uh, not the least, but also an awareness of many other topics surrounding our financial lives and a lot of common sense wisdom along the way. So uh, we have some specific uh, client questions to kick off with here. The first of which is uh, in these turbulent uh, financial times, there are many uh, analysts who have been recommending that people reduce their personal risk of exposure to systemic risk. We certainly had Janet Yellen explaining uh, to Congress recently about uh, how they are trying to, the, they being the Treasury and the Fed, uh, reduce systemic risk to the banking system. You've got your own uh, ore in that, uh, in that water with the starting of a bank, Battle Bank. And uh, this question is around this, as we are constantly being told how to be our own, we are being told to be our own central bank, but how do we write uh, loans or get liquidity against our physical holdings. Will Battle Bank have to be in physical possession of holdings to write against? I can assume, or at least I will assume, that uh, given that the question came through uh, Dunnigan Kaiser, uh, that the physical precious metals in question were bought through Andy Schechtman, uh, you, you know, and or uh, Miles Franklin, his firm. True. Uh, in order to borrow money against physical precious metals from Battle Bank, uh, the metals themselves will need to be in a segregated account. Uh, I know that uh, Miles Franklin offers those accounts. I believe that you offer them through Brinks. But if they're uh, Brinks and then also a partnership with Dakota Depository and Fargo, yes, a couple different so different ways. From our viewpoint, uh, Battle Bank's viewpoint, that metal would initially need to be at Brinks, uh, Loomis, or Viamat. We prefer that the vaulting company uh, be uh, in a public company and audited so that we don't have to take their word for the existence and the providence <laughs> of our client's metal. So uh, people who bought metal through Miles Franklin if they had that metal uh, in storage at Brinks, Viamat, or Loomis, and, and perhaps over time, <clears throat> we'll learn enough about uh, Dakota that we can include that them to that list. And the gold is in uh, segregated storage, not unallocated storage. From our point of view, that's good collateral. We've done, I say we, I at Sprott did business with Miles Franklin for 20 years, uh, and we're comfortable with Miles Franklin as the financial intermediary. Uh, so we don't need physical possession uh, as the creditor. What we need is the, the precious metal in a segregated account uh, with a, a vaulting and storage company that we know and love and trust. <laughs> uh, and that's fine. Uh, that's absolutely fine. What happens is we sign a credit agreement uh, with the storage company so that to the extent that our collateral gets sold, we get paid. Uh, that's why we want to know, that, that's why we're so picky uh, about 
uh, thus far Brinks, Loomis, or Viamat. We've done business with them. Uh, at least I've done business with all of them for 30 years, uh, and we're comfortable with them. Sort of a related question for people who may have taken personal possession of physical precious metals, uh, regardless of whether they purchased them from Miles Franklin or anywhere else, and, and are wanting to uh, potentially uh, leverage liquidity off of those, and they're re basically returning them back into storage. Uh, this is a very specific question about COMEX bars, and that's a minority of the holdings of any of our clients is in the roughly 1,000 ounce uh, COMEX bars, which were originally considered uh, good delivery bars in system, in COMEX warehouses, but they were taken out of those COMEX warehouses in order to physically deliver them into the personal possession of clients. The question is, if most bars have been pulled off the COMEX system and are now out of the system, and you're trying to reintroduce them into a commercial banking situation, how, what would be the protocol? Do you just assume the COMEX review of those bars was good enough, or are they going to have to be each uh, evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis or each bar? The bars normally, uh, to be reintroduced to the system, uh, have to be at least spot assayed. Uh, I know that Miles Franklin, as an example, if those bars <clears throat> were reintroduced into the Miles Franklin system, would at the very least be subject to XRF inspection. Uh, which is external uh, inspection. So there's two levels of verification as I own it, as I understand it pers per pers uh, personally. One would be to reintroduce that bar into the COMEX system, uh, which is somewhat more complex than simply uh, making the, the bar uh, good delivery from Miles Franklin's point of view, from Viamat's point of view, and from BattleBank's point of view. If the bars were certified uh, as uh, good delivery collateral by Miles Franklin, uh, they become decent collateral for Battle Bank. They do not, uh, as a consequence of that, become good delivery for a COMEX trade, uh, which is to say, if you were short that silver on COMEX and went to deliver uh, a bar that had been taken out of system, that doesn't, that isn't good delivery. And the bar would, in fact, need to be reassayed. Now, understand that this uh, reassaying procedure, uh, in terms of cost, relative to the value in a uh, thousand ounce silver bar, is fairly de minimis. Uh, this isn't an ugly test, but it's one that if you want to introduce the bar back into the COMEX system, that you have to do. It's very intriguing, and. Uh... Any other thoughts from you before we move on to talking about the upcoming boot camp of electric and battery metals uh, investing boot camp uh, on this topic of becoming your own central bank? You've talked to us for years about maintaining cash liquidity, maintaining bullion liquidity. Uh, your philosophy or specific applied practical suggestions around people who dearly want to do that in this environment where we've seen multiple bank failures in the last month or so. I, I can't stress enough common sense, uh, which seems to be uncommon. Um, a listener of yours, and let's just keep the math simple, a, a listener of yours <clears throat> with a million dollar portfolio um, probably ought to have uh, $100,000 in cash or near cash. And that $100,000 in cash or near cash uh, ought to be either in very, very short term treasuries. Uh, or in certificates of deposit, uh, preferably well below $250,000, more like $200,000, so that the accretion of interest is also federally insured, <laughs> with banks uh, that are solvent banks. Uh, certainly, Battle Bank will be a hyper-solid bank, but we're not in place yet. So Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach, First National Bank of Hemet, First National Bank of Alaska, Banks that have uh, common equity of more than 10% of total assets. Uh, banks that don't have uh, ugly mismatches, time duration mismatches between the time frame on their deposits uh, and their loan portfolio. Uh, banks that don't have too much by way of very large uninsured deposits, which can trigger bank runs. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess, uh, well, banks, and by the way, every, everything that I'm telling you can be obtained from the bank's statement of financial condition. But I would say that the fourth criterion in 
a, a panic situation, which I think we are in now, uh, is that a bank needs to have reasonable cash liquidity relative to the size of its demand and now deposits. Uh, it's less important to me that they have cash liquidity to cover uh, their less time sensitive certificates of deposit. But banks, you know, as an example, like Bank of America, uh, where uh, over 50 percent of their deposits uh, are uh, either now deposits or large uninsured deposits, have to maintain a, a large amount of liquidity. Now, frankly, the Bank of America does have that liquidity, but you need to make sure that your bank has enough liquidity that they can handle momentary panics. I also think that in a circumstance like we're in today, uh, that in addition to having at least $100,000 in cash, that that same million dollar portfolio ought to have a, at least $100,000 in gold, or, gold and or silver bullion. The uh, allocation between gold and silver really depends on who you are as an investor, what your means are, uh, and what your tolerance for volatility is. If you are a scaredy cat, uh, then you wanna overweight gold. Uh, gold, from my point of view, is insurance. One could call it really good if volatile cash. You can always sell it, uh, and it performs well, even in liquidity squeezes. Silver is very different. Uh, you are owning silver as a speculative asset class. You are owning it because you believe that once we head into a precious metals bull market, that silver will outperform the gold. Uh, so if your motivation for precious metals is fear, you hold gold. If your motivation for holding precious metals is greed, you hold silver. If you are like most people and you express both, <laughs> both emotions, you hold the metal in varying amounts depending on the level of, your, of greed relative to your level of fear. Uh, on top of that, uh, we've allocated 10% of a person's portfolio to near cash, very short-term instruments. We've allocated 10% of a person's portfolio to bullion. Investors uh, can look beyond that to gold stocks uh, as investments, the biggest and the best as investments. The size of that exposure is really up to the individual investor. Uh, and of course, the third asset class uh, are the juniors, in particular, the silver juniors. Uh, owning those represents pure greed, uh, understand, that these are really tertiary assets. These are assets that in a liquidity squeeze will suffer in the market. Uh, and these are assets too, that in a rip roaring precious metals bull market, which I think we'll come into, will outperform just about any other speculative asset class on the planet. Uh, so this again is where the juxtaposition between greed and fear <laughs> come into real focus. When you mention uh, shares of gold or silver companies, either mining companies or uh, development, the um, recent uh, press that came out about Barrick Gold, which has been a darling of uh, uh, Warren Buffett and others recently, it's a very you know large, big name, that sort of thing. But there was uh, some petitions coming out about the ecological impact on the communities where they where they're operating and so on. Is are there any mining companies that come to mind for you where through your research you're convinced have they're just standouts in terms of their uh i guess corporate citizenship to the to the people who are most directly affected by their operations from an environmental standpoint well ironically i think barrick is one of those uh i think that the reality is very different from the press their big environmental sin uh, i think was pasqualama uh, and that was, in fact, uh, a sin is too strong. But the truth is that they made representations to the government of Argentina and the government of Chile uh, with regards to glaciation and also with regards to um, <clears throat> surface work uh, and silt. And they didn't keep their word. They're being punished for it and they deserve it. <laughs> but if you look at the work that Barrick does around the world in northern Nevada, uh, in the Dominican Republic at Pueblo Viejo, uh, in, in the Congo, in Mali. Uh, I think that Barrick is a standout performer with regards to 
environmental remediation uh, and best practices around both the environment and community sociology. So I would hold Barrick up as one of the few truly investment grade gold companies in the world. Uh, it is kept company there by names like Franco Nevada, which is simply the finest precious metals miner in the world, but not cheap. Uh, Wheaton Precious Metals, uh, another royalty and streaming company, very high margin company. Uh, probably a a Agnico Eagle uh, would be uh, another name in that class. <clears throat> and if you're willing to come down the quality trail a little bit and take African political risk, uh, Endeavor Mining, which has been a great uh, capital allocator uh, and a wonderful, wonderful growth story with a wonderful pipeline. Uh, uh, understand that I'm talking there about uh, investors, not speculators, who are looking to capture market beta, not market alpha. Uh, I've told people for years, invest before you speculate. Uh, the list I gave you is not the hyperactive penny dreadfuls uh, that we can talk about some other time. Uh, with regards to trying to outperform a market in a good market. You didn't also this time include your confessional that that's not the path that you took personally in your life. Early on in my life, that's correct. Uh, all of the money that I now invest rationally, I made by speculating wildly. Uh, and that needs to be said. Uh, do as I say, not as I did. Understand that most of the people listening to this broadcast have a life. I didn't. I worked 70 or 80 hours a week. Uh, I took uh, insane risk, but I took informed risk. I didn't have a day job. That was my day job. Most of the people listening to this uh, have families. They have hobbies. <laughs> they have lives. Uh, and they need to balance their uh, appetite for risk with their ability to assume that risk. I promised earlier that we would talk about the upcoming electric and battery metals boot camp, investing boot camp that you have planned later this month and uh, wanted to give you a chance. I believe it's April 29th coming right up. And could you give people a chance in realizing that they don't have to travel, they don't have to pay for accommodations, and they don't even have to take off work to be able to benefit fully from uh, the 100% virtual upcoming boot camp, investing boot camp on electric and battery metals, what will they expect uh, should they sign up? And by the way, folks, there's a link in the description of this video if you choose to. Well, I'm hugely excited about it. And thank you, by the way, uh, for uh, your assistance in popularizing uh, all of our educational products, including the boot camp. It's important for your listening audience to know that isn't, that isn't familiar with our boot camps, that this will be our third. We did a uranium boot camp, highly successful. We did a silver boot camp, also successful. The uh, electric and battery metals boot camp uh, came about because we polled our audience as to what topic they wanted to hear about next. Uh, this is this didn't come from on high. Uh, it's really as a consequence of popular demand. When I say the last boot camps were successful, the uranium boot camp had 3,200 attendees. The silver boot camp, 25 or 2,600 attendees. Uh, this boot camp will go in the same format because that format is so successful. We will open it up with WMC Metals, uh, a worldwide commodity trader, uh, uh, worldwide commodity marketer, worldwide commodity uh, market expert, the same people who opened up the uranium boot camp for us. And they'll give an hour and a half long overview of uh, the market for metals like platinum and palladium, uh, vanadium, cobalt, nickel, copper, all of lithium, rare earths, all of the materials that go into the energy transformation economy, all of the materials that go into your cell phone, all of the materials that go into batteries, all of the materials involved in the electrification of humankind, not just electric vehicles, but every aspect of it. Uh, and in addition to talking in a very broad sense about supply and demand, with regards to WMC, what they're doing is setting the stage for us to teach you how to make money <laughs> in electric and battery metals. It's important that you understand the dynamics of the market uh, in the context of you making money in these markets. So on top of that, of course, we will have, as we always have had, wonderful uh, analysts 
uh, wonderful portfolio managers who talk about how to implement the strategies that are suggested by the market overview that you've just heard. We move on from there <clears throat> to our exhibitors. Uh, in most conferences, exhibitors are advertisers, and the qualification to be an, ad, uh, an advertiser is simply a check that cashes. Our audience has told us that our exhibitors are content, not advertisers. What that means is that every exhibitor we have, we have to own in our own accounts. Sadly, Dunnigan, the fact that I own a stock <laughs> is no guarantee it goes up. But it is a guarantee that I and my staff have studied the stock well enough that we have invested both our time and our treasure uh, in this stock. As you suggest, unlike our physical conferences, this is a virtual conference. Uh, you can attend it from your own home. Uh, in addition to that, you will have access to uh, be able to replay the conference uh, for six months. I have learned myself, despite putting on these boot camps, that I can't absorb all the information that's available in eight hours. I have now replayed the uranium boot camp four times, uh, in addition to being present when it was presented the first time. And it's important to note with the electric and battery metals boot camp that you will have your first access to it, as you suggest, uh, in a little over 10 days, uh, less than 10 days, actually. But you'll have repeated access to it uh, over the course uh, of six months. Finally, Dunnigan, like every investor education product I've offered in the last 30 years, this comes with an ironclad money back guarantee. The tuition is very cheap. It's $99. If you don't feel like you got your $99 worth, email me and I'll give you your $99 back. It would be useful if you told me why you didn't feel that you got your money, your money's worth, so I could improve my product. But there's no requirement that you come groveling and begging for your money back. It's your money. If I didn't deliver, I don't want your money. Uh, I, I want to give it back to you. I need to say in 30 years of making these money back guarantees, I've had to refund less than two tenths of 1% <laughs> of the tuitions that I've charged. But I think it's useful that we are confident enough in this product that we will likely have over 2000 attendees and we offer without any reservation an absolute ironclad money back guarantee. So uh, people, if I understand correctly, by signing up for this conference, they're going to get an electric car delivered to the driveway. Is that right? <laughs> uh, not even a model. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the little toilet. No. You know, I, I think electric car is a really good segue, Dunnigan, because people who live in the United States think about electrification in the context of Tesla or power walls or something like that. But the context of electrification is much bigger. Most people don't understand that there are still a billion people on Earth that have no access to electricity whatsoever. Uh, that number, by the way, 40 years ago was well in excess of two, 2 billion. So we've done a wonderful job as humankind uh, advancing the material living standards of the poorest of the poor. But the big theme uh, around electrification is not electric cars. Uh, it is uh, providing electricity to a billion people on Earth who don't have it and to another 2 billion people on Earth who have access to either unaffordable uh, or intermittent electricity. Uh, if you look back some years to the urbanization of China, really beginning in the mid 90s, and the bull market that that kicked off in the period sort of 1998 to 2010, you understand the impact that electrification is going to have on the world. And what you saw in China will be um, in fits and starts, uh, applicable in Indonesia, in India, in Pakistan, uh, in Brazil. This is wonderful for humankind. Uh, it, it is a very good thing to have happen. And it has really uh, pronounced economic importance. At the same time that we are rapidly increasing the number of consumers for electric products and electric materials, we're coming into a period where as a consequence of 30 years of underinvestment and exploration and development, that we will meet this incredible increase in demand with a decrease in supply <laughs> over the next five years. I don't need to tell any of your audience who attended a first year economics course what happens in the face of increased demand and reduced supply. 
it has a really Im- interesting impact on prices. Now, I, you know, your audience probably doesn't need to be told uh, a recession or a depression could derail this bull market, but only temporarily. Uh, what I have noted in my life as an investor is that the ascent of humankind is the most important fundamental driver in the world, which is to say that a recession or a depression, uh, I think a recession is likely, I think a depression is not, postpones the inevitable. The inevitable is the ascent of humankind and the impact of the ascent of of humankind uh, on uh, markets that are necessary for the material well-being of the whole planet. In addition to your natural resource investing conferences that you have sponsored through the years, you've also had uh, ones on ethics and morals and that sort of thing that related to the, the, the treatment of our fellow humans, the treatment of the earth as we're, as we're moving forward. There is some pretty significant concern in the current era on the part of many of our viewers hearing that there are stated objectives of uh, globalist organizations saying that they have a desire to reduce human population by 90% and and not have the poorest of the poor be able to attain Western standard of living, et cetera, because the earth can't support it in their view, that sort of thing. Uh, you've tended to opt on the side of uh, efficiency and technology and doing things smarter, not harder as ways of getting people to enjoy uh, higher standards of living uh, in a sustainable way. Can you just remind us of where you believe uh, we have been coming and going and where we need to continue to go uh, in that regards? Well, I value the voices of the Malthusians. Uh, I think they have the right to freedom of expression and freedom of action. I came up through university being subjected to the views of the Malthusians. I remember Jeremy Rifkin and the Club of Rome uh, and all of those morons, the sort of early day Greta Thornburgs. Uh, I guess that tells you who I re- how I really feel, uh, who were telling us in the 1970s that by the year 2000, 50 million people a year would be dying of starvation, that the polar ice caps would have melted that the price of oil would be $250 a barrel, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things. It is difficult to be as wrong as they were. It is truly difficult to be as wrong as they were because they forget two things. One, markets work. And two, technology works. Uh, The proportional cost of food in the average household budget worldwide in the last 60 years (laughs) <laughs> has declined by two thirds. <laughs> Food now consumes about 15% of the average household budget in the United States. Uh, far from starving, the biggest public health challenge that we face around food now is obesity. So I think it's important that the Malthusians understand that markets work. But I also think it's important that they have a voice. I think it's important that they follow that voice. To the extent that they think that the world's population needs to be cut in half, they shouldn't have kids. The idea that they believe that they should take 800 private jets to Davos to tell me to drive less seems a little suspect to me. Uh, I, I certainly believe that people who don't believe in internal combustion engines shouldn't have them. Uh, I I think that's a wonderful set of circumstances, but I would prefer that they would understand that their preferences are just that, uh, that they're not commands. I have been very lucky, Dunnigan, in the course of what I do as a resource investor, uh, to travel to literally dozens of countries around the world, most of them frontier and emerging markets. And I have watched Uh, the wonderful progression of the lives of the poorest of the poor over the last 40 or 45 years. Uh, I have watched us succeed as a species in materially increasing the living standards of hundreds of millions of people, which I think is a very wonderful thing. I'll point you to Malawi. 40 years ago in Malawi, The two big public health challenges uh, were infectious disease, you know, malaria, uh, sleeping sickness, stuff like that, 
uh, and in particular starvation. Uh, as I say, the biggest public health challenge around food in Malawi now is obesity. And I'm not saying it's good to be fat, but that's a choice. Starvation wasn't a choice. And I look forward to uh, in the next 20 or 30 years or however long I'm graced by being on this planet. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing us finish the job, uh, which is to see, say to which is to say that we are successful in increasing the material living standards of the poorest of the poor on a global basis. We've done a great job so far, uh, but we have a lot more work to do. Uh, a lot more work to do. At, and it's important as an investment theme, getting away from the morality, that you understand the investment implications of this. When poor people get more purchasing power, the thing that they spend their money on willingly, the thing that, is, that improves their lives are very, very, very commodity intensive. They might increase the per capita calorie count uh, in their home from 1,300 calories to 2,200 calories. You and I need to, well, maybe not you, but I need to eat less, but they need to eat more. They, their method of transportation literally goes from barefoot to sandals, to a bicycle, to a 50cc motorcycle, to a Toyota Hilux. Their uh, dwelling might go from a, a reed hut to cinder block. Their roof goes from thatch to steel. The point is that as poor people become more le less poor, uh, what they spend their money on is materially intense. When you get more money, you spend it on a service. You take your wife out to dinner. You might buy some little gizmo from Apple that weighs seven grams. <laughs> but you spend more money programming it than you would to buy it. The point is when you and I make more money, the stuff that we buy is service intensive. But when poor people make more money, the stuff that they buy is material and commodity intensive. And that's going to be a really, really important theme for the next 10 or 20 years. And it's going to be a very, very, very good thing. Before we leave this topic of uh, major themes and global pressures and, and um, I guess, uh, hypocrisy around that, uh, there's also been the point made that the stated aims of reducing uh, the human carbon footprint and so on is uh, not only is difficult to take seriously when people are flying in private jets to tell you that, but also the fact that a free pass is given to countries like China and India where uh, those concerns are definitely on the back burner compared to you know front burner prop front burner profitability and, and efficiency and that sort of thing. So uh, can you talk to us about the, the uh, how believable it is that in fact, the stated aims are even really the, the aims of those pressing for uh, curbs on everyone else's standard of living? I'm not gonna address uh, the science behind global warming. I'll leave that to your viewers. I personally believe that we should put less crap in the air. <laughs> I personally believe that we should put less stuff in the water. So irrespective uh, of your belief in human caused global warming, the idea that we as a species should pollute less, I think is a very good thing. If you take the statements around the carbon market uh, and you look at it from the point of view of emerging and frontier markets, the Chinese and the Indians, their point of view is that you don't, you shouldn't measure carbon loadings on a country by country basis. You should do it on a per capita basis. The Chinese point out that the Chinese citizenry generate about 15% of the carbon per capita that Americans do. The Chinese also point out that in terms of global warming, in terms of the, consu the, the uh, concern about carbon, that you need to look at historic loadings because the carbon that has been put into the atmosphere over 150 years, much of it is still there. And the Chinese would suggest that their historic carbon footprint, going back to the pre-2000 time frame, was non-existent compared to us. And they would suggest that in this great carbon bank of the world, that they have a credit and we have a deficit. And it's very hard from a scientific or moralistic point of view to talk about the fact that they're wrong. Uh, if you accept the fact that they're not wrong, uh, that in fact they're right, it's cynical for us to suggest that they don't have the right to the same material standard of living that we do. Uh, 
Uh, and as a consequence of the fact that they are consuming per capita 15 percent of what we're consuming, uh, if you accept that point of view, the onus is on us, not on them. Uh, I, I realize that that's a highly unpopular point of view uh, from Americans who want to maintain their standard of living, which I think they'll do. But if you understand the other side of the argument, you begin to understand the complexity uh, around the argument. Where I begin to have challenges with the policy response from the big thinkers is if the big thinkers were really, really interested in carbon neutrality, uh, I, I wonder why they aren't pro-nuclear or, or more pro-nuclear. From uh, a national point of view, the probably strongest country uh, with regards to anti-carbon politics is Germany. And, and ironically, the Germans have shut down their nuclear fleet and they've replaced that energy, well, first of all, with higher energy prices, uh, up fivefold, uh, but with coal, <laughs> the dirtiest and most polluting of all. The Germans have decided in their wisdom that their future is going to be solar, which is a really interesting choice for a northern country where the sun doesn't shine much. And I think... Uh, other than merely making fun of the Germans, what we need to do is take into account reality. Uh, we need to take into account that all of our problems with regards to material prosperity uh, over the last hundred years have been solved where they have been solved with technology, uh, be it carbon capture, uh, be it certainly alternative energy. But we also need to understand that Nobody seems to be willing to reduce their material standard of living. Uh, and the poor people, the poorest people in the world, the people who don't have access to electricity at all, the people who want to live like you and I want to live, uh, those people are choosing whatever form of electricity is the cheapest. Dunnigan, many of your listeners won't know because they read the popular press in the United States, that the largest demand year on record for coal was 2022. Uh, that demand for coal will be eclipsed in 2023. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm not saying a, it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's a thing. And investors need to pay attention to that. The big thinkers of the world, the Bidens of the world, the Merkels of the world, the Trudeaus of the world, uh, will tell you that peak oil demand will occur in 2030. They're wrong. Peak oil demand will occur in 2050 or 2055 and then taper off slowly from there. Uh, we will be using uh, petrochemicals uh, and oil and gas for 70 or 75 years. So when people look at the investment implications of that, when somebody is looking at the cash flows of an oil company uh, and they're assuming a terminal value, the end of the industry, in 2030 or, or 2032, what they're doing is buying into the same load of rubbish that was fed to us in the 1960s and 1970s by the Club of Rome, who said that we would run out of oil, we would run out of food, we would run out of natural resources, that we would have widespread starvation and energy shortages around the world by the year 2000. They were wrong because they didn't understand that markets work. They were wrong because they didn't understand the ability of technology to create solution for human problems on an ongoing basis. Were it not for the oil and gas industry, we wouldn't have whales. We used to kill whales <laughs> to uh, do what we, what we do now through oil and gas. What saved the whales? It wasn't Greenpeace. It was technology. People figured out how to refine hydrocarbons. Uh, looking forward. What will put uh, hydrocarbons out of business a very, very, very long time from now are conservation technologies using how to le learning how to use energy more efficiently, nuclear, a panoply of technologies. By the way, it's going to have a happy ending. Uh, it's just that getting between here and there <laughs> is going to be frustrating and sometimes scary. I can empathize with the getting from here to there being frustrating and scary because my wife and I just moved two weeks ago to Florida and it's been frustrating and scary. So anyway, <laughs> uh, Rick, you've often offered additional uh, free uh, information to people if they wanted to take advantage of that. Uh, do you want to re-up that at this time? 
I do. I would love to do that. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I've been involved in investor education, as you know, Donegan, for 30 years. And education is always best received by people when it's specific. So here's the offer. Any of your listeners who care what I think about natural resource investments, in particular their own, can find out by visiting my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Enter your natural resource portfolio there. Please no tech stocks. Please no pot stocks. Please no crypto. And I'll rank them personally, one to 10, if I know the company. And I'll comment on any companies where uh, I think my comments might have value. That's ruleinvestmentmedia.com. You will see uh, room there for questions and comments. Uh, If you care uh, about our boot camp uh, or our ongoing boot camps, or if you care about our wonderful live conference in Boca Raton uh, in July of this year, write conference uh, or write boot camp. Further, if you're an accredited investor and want to participate speculatively in private placements, uh, I will tell you what private placements I'm participating in if you are a private placement investor, if you're an accredited investor. In the question and comment section, simply write placements. Finally, uh, if you are either afraid of your bank or frustrated by your bank, Uh, and or if you own precious metals uh, and would like the ability to access cash uh, secured by your precious metals, either to buy more precious metals or to do something else with the money, uh, or simply if you want to learn about a bank that does things like pay you interest, uh, a well-capitalized bank, a bank that's efficient uh, on all the ratios that we talked about earlier in the show, in the question and comment section, write either bank or battle bank. And we will add you to the 7,000 person list of people who would like to be customers of Battle Bank uh, once it's become federally chartered. So rule investment media, rankings, list your natural resource stocks, I'll rank them. Uh, Education, conferences, if you care and you should. Remember, money back guarantee for any uh, investor education product I offer. Placements, if you're an accredited investor and care about speculating in private placements, and bank uh, if you believe you could be better served by the banking industry than you are being served today. And folks, remember, if you look in the description of this video, you will find a link that allows you to right away register for that 100% virtual uh, boot camp that's coming up on battery electric and battery metals investing uh, that Rick's putting out. It's coming up in less than 10 days here on April 29th. You don't want to miss that. And... uh, Rick, as always, on behalf of all of our viewers, I just thank you for joining us here again on Liberty and Finance. A pleasure. I always uh, enjoy these conversations, and I always like the ability to answer questions that your your listeners forward to you. I wish I could bring all of them forward. That I get I get peppered with them throughout the the, the time in between our views uh, together, and uh, this time I was able to slip in a couple. So thank you for for fielding those as you always are willingly, and thanks for joining us. I enjoyed the whole process. Thank you. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is a rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, Metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. 
That's 1-888-815-4237.